everybody. Welcome to the Jim Masters Show, Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Jim Masters here in the host chair reporting for duty once again, coming to you from the New York area here in the United States. Hope everybody's doing well. Thanks for tuning in, making us a part of your life, part of your day, morning, noon, and night, whatever time it is when you're watching this episode of the JMS series. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate all the support, all of the love, all of the comments, the likes, the sharing, subscribing to the YouTube channel, all those fun things. And uh, of course, all of your kind words about our series, bringing back the lost art of conversation with all the light, love, levity, and our famous Gym Master Show, Lovity as we call it, and the hundreds and hundreds of episodes, celebrity guests and friends who stopped by, and many of them making return visits as well. And that's what's happening right now on this episode. I'm so excited, so delighted, because it's on the heels of some very exciting news as well, to welcome back to the Gym Masters Show series, one of our beloved guests, multi-talented singer, actress, teacher extraordinaire, celebrated jazz and pop vocalist extraordinaire, the one and only Natalie Douglas is with us. She's in the house. Well, she's in her house. And we are going to share some new music and all kinds of incredible things that are happening in her life. She is such an extraordinary, passionate, and very enthusiastic, talented, effervescent human being. And she's somebody who cares about humanity. She cares about people. She cares about music and life and bringing people together. And you guys know we talk about that a lot here on the show. The celebrated pop jazz concert and recording artist, Releasing her latest album, Back to the Garden, the released concert at New York's Birdland, dates in San Francisco, London, Florida, and beyond. She's traveling all over the world. And her Back to the Garden, well, it is incredible. I got a chance to hear it, which is always one of the perks of this job. It's getting a chance to sample some of the incredible things that our guests do. And it is is spectacular. There it is. Beautiful, glowing cover, lots of joy and happiness in her face. And it is, there's a story behind the title as well, which Natalie is going to be sharing with us, but she has always been uh, a revered and celebrated talent. And she's just somebody that gives back, somebody that really knocks it out of the park. Her concerts, make sure you get your tickets whenever you see her coming to you, because it sells out fast. People love her voice, her stories. Back to the Garden is a potent mix of golden age standards, pop gems of the Woodstock generation, and special surprises as well. We're going to be talking about that again here on this episode. You know, she also does so many fabulous tributes to the legends, Shirley Bassey and so many others, Roberta Flack. You got to catch one of those shows as well. But Back to the Garden is something new and extra special with lots of surprises. Highlights include a vivacious big band arrangement of Cole Porter's classic, Begin the Begin, a tender version of the ballad, You'll Never Know, with a sensuous string arrangement and a driving rock-inspired interpretation of Joni Mitchell's Woodstock. And of course, we're a fan of Joni. Natalie's a fan of Joni. I love how she pays homage to some of the incredible people in the industry. It also features a new ballad, Love is the Power That Heals Me. Don't you just love that title? It is so true and it is so needed in our world right now. That was written just for Natalie by the label's co-founders and what may be the official debut recording of the song, He Lives in a World of His Own, which Oliver creator Lionel Burt wrote for Shirley Bassey. Shirley Bassey, one of my favorite performers, of course, as well. She's extraordinary. Got a whole collection of her CDs in our collection as well. She is always, uh, Natalie, always hailed as an extraordinary true force of nature, according to the uh, Times of London. She is a 13-time Mac and two-time Backstage Bistro and Margaret Whiting Award winner who has her portrait hanging on the legendary Birdland Wall of Fame. And she's a favorite of broadcasters. Her music is featured on NPR, Sirius XM, BBC, and so much more. She's amazing. And guess what? She's joining us here on the Jim Masters Show right now 
for a return visit. And here she is. Welcome. Hi. Hey, How are you? It's so great to see you. It's so great to see you. I'm well, too. Thank you. Thank you. That's quite the intro. I'm, I'm excited to meet me now. <laughs> <laughs> Grab a ticket. <laughs> Download that album. Um, you know, this is your return visit, and it was such a wonderful time when you were here last time. And one of our dear friends, um, Ralph Lampkin, was somebody who put us together initially. And, of course, we lost him. And I know that you've had fond remembrances of working with that gentle soul. And he was a friend of ours as well. Was there anything you wanted to share about Ralph for the viewers who, you know, knew of him through our show and through your work as well, Natalie? Sure. I mean, I, I you know, I never met anybody who knew Ralph or worked with Ralph who didn't love him. You know, he had that that ability to make people fall madly in love with him. Um, I, I'm sure he wasn't always an easy person just because he was human, but that certainly wasn't my experience. He was easy to work with, easy to talk to, just the greatest guy. And um, we knew each other a long, long time. I think um, we met back in the 88 days um, in the village in yeah. in New York City. Um, I think that's where we first met. I'm not positive because one of those people I felt like I knew forever, you know, forever, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, we had, a, I did a, a variety show a couple months ago, shortly after he passed um, here in New York city. I don't know if you know, um, Mary Jo Mundy. Oh, sure. Rollins. Yeah. Yeah. Show too. yeah. Yeah. They're terrific singers. They have this show with another friend of theirs, Alexis, um, that they created in Los Angeles um that they call the right to cabaret which is very fun and they each sing duets they sing group numbers and then they have guests um so the first time they did it here in new york city was this past november i believe um and i happened to run into mary jo um who now lives in S san francisco uh, when i was in san francisco last may um we go several times a year i perform there a lot and my dad lives there so um we we literally ran into each other when i had just said her name i sent her name to my husband and said you know i have to get in touch with mary jo monday because i know she lives up here now and and she walked out of the hotel <laughs> She was at the Nico seeing the show that night and we were staying at the Nico and walking back in. So we started chatting and she said, oh, you have to come on the show. And that was months and months ago. And then we lost Ralph. And so by the time we did the show, Mary Jo and Hillary Rollins and, you know, all of us who were connected to the show who knew him wanted to do something just for him. So there was actually a really beautiful slideshow presentation they did and and we sang, and it, it was a really lovely moment, just celebrating how much he meant to all of us. That's he was so a great beautiful. Guy. Absolutely so beautiful to, to do that and to do it in his honor, Natalie. It's just a testament to the kind of person you are. You're so passionate, and you truly understand the human condition. And this fabulous collection of amazing songs are... You know, they really touch the heart and the soul. When I had an opportunity to get that exclusive download preview before our conversation, we've listened to it here in the house multiple times. I encourage everybody to add this to your music collection. If you want to feel good about life and living, if you want to feel passionate, you want to hear her extraordinary voice and talents and these incredible arrangements. She surrounds herself with fabulous arrangers and musicians and so much more. You've got to get this uh, album. We're going to tell you about how you can do that in just a second. But you're, you're somebody who really goes beyond just being an entertainer and a performer. You're a storyteller. You are, you're operating from a higher consciousness. You are a deep <laughs> feeler and you really yeah. love to bring people together and inspire them through your art. Don't you, my friend? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I, I love great stories. I love to listen to them. So I learned to tell them. <laughs> um, my parents were, my adopted parents were great storytellers. They were both very funny and very charming and they were often the life of the party um and my, my mother was a psychologist my father was an engineer um but they both did a lot of things um my godfather growing up was um my mother's cousin was also the mayor of los angeles so politics was sort of the family business too so i got a great dose of 
like people. And and being and I think by virtue of them adopting me later in life, uh, and I was raised an only child, um, I was around adults a lot, and so I I spent I kind of got used to being around people and talking to people and learning about them. Uh, I found people fascinating. I still do. Um, so you know I spent a lot of time listening to people's stories, and um, I hope it's made me good at telling stories because i really love it i i'm a geek i love the research it's my favorite um i you know whenever i embark on one of these shows especially the tribute shows obviously because those are celebrating a specific artist um i read all the bios i i do a deep dive you know i um find weird little clips from interviews they've done that you know have been lost to time but thankfully we have access to that thanks to YouTube because some fan somewhere has uploaded the interview that Ella Fitzgerald did in Norway in 1964. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like, you start Googling and you start looking for this stuff on YouTube and you find these great gems. When I first did the Roberta Flack show, I did that in 2019. And there is today is still not a, a book about Roberta. Um, there is a new uh, documentary, American Masters, released oh, yeah. something last January celebrating her life and talking about her legacy and her brilliant gifts. Um, but when I was putting it together the first time, there wasn't anything like that. So I had to get it all from newspaper articles and magazine articles and, and interviews. And I found this piece of footage of Luther Vandross talking mm -hmm. about one of his first jobs in the business being singing backup for her. And how kind she was, and and a moment that she encouraged him, that stayed with him throughout his entire career. And hearing him talk about it in his own voice was just so moving. And it, it became one of my favorite stories in the show, just because you know I, it's not something I read anywhere or and I had never heard before, even though I've been a fan of hers forever, and I still am. I mean, I think she's a magnificent. When did you realize that you had this gift, not only of storytelling, but interpretation and your beautiful voice and, and all of these things that are a fabulous package that have come together? Was it something that was discovered by the family and by others when you were a kid? Or was it something that you started to notice? How did it all begin for you early on and some of those inspirations in your life, Natalie? Sure. Um, well, I've told this story a million times, but my mother taught me to sing when I was four. I was uh, bothering her, I'm sure. She had come home from work and was making dinner. And uh, I remember being in the kitchen and asking a million questions because that, that's how you learn. Um, and as you might guess, I've been talking a lot ever since I learned how. And um, so, so I'm sure I was okay, driving her nuts. <laughs> You're so good at what you do, though, right? <laughs> um, so uh, she taught me a song. Um, actually, one of the songs on the album, You'll Never Know. Um, and and she told me if I went to my room and practiced it, I could come back and sing it for her and dad at dinner, wow. like a floor show, you know. So my first gig, I was thrilled. And um, I went into my room and I ran it. I mean, I and I remember vividly standing in my room alone going over and over the lyrics making up a tag which i don't even know how i knew what a tag was but somehow i did i did watch a lot of movie musicals with all my babysitters so maybe that was it i don't know but i i created like an ending and i i thought to myself oh i'm a singer like <laughs> like of course i'm a singer um now I didn't tell anybody else that for a really long time, but I, but I continued to do it. And um, my mother wanted me to be a well-rounded young lady. So um, she sent me to finishing school and I took all sorts of, of extracurricular lessons. I played the piano and I played the harp and I did drill team and I did gymnastics and I did tap and ballet. And, you know, so music was part of that. And I took, voice lessons too. Um, uh, but, but really for chorale singing, for singing in choruses and, and group singing. Um, so it was just something I always, always did. 
And uh, somewhere in college, um, I went to um, undergrad at 16 and I went to grad school at 19. And in grad school, um, friends started really bugging me to sing when we would go places. And there were places in, I grew up in LA, there were places in LA that had kind of an open mic, you know, talent show thing. Mm. Um, and, and so I had friends who would take me to these events and, and put my name on the list, whether I wanted it or not. And over time, I began to realize that it wasn't just my friends in the room cheering, you know, that, that, that there were strangers here who seemed to like what I did. So I, I thought, Hey, maybe, maybe I really could be a singer for real. So, you know, I started saying yes to every kind of weird little gig. I, for a while, I worked at a steakhouse at Westwood. Um, they, they couldn't afford to pay me because they already had a guy there playing guitar and singing on Sunday and Monday nights. But there were lots of songs he didn't know the words to. He knew how to play them, but he didn't know the words. And, and one night, uh, an NFL player, um, a, a LA Ram, and sadly, I don't know his name because I don't know football. It's my husband's department. Um, so I, I didn't know who he was, but I, but I knew he was a football player. It was obvious. He was beautiful and gigantic. And um, he gave the guy a hundred bucks and said, can you sing Blue Bayou? And he said, I can play it. I can't sing it, but I can play it. And then he looked at me because he, he, he was a friend of a friend. And I was sitting near him with another friend. And he said, Natalie, do you know it? And I said, actually, I do. Uh, in C. <laughs> and he said, okay. So I sang it. And I started to walk away. And he handed me the $100. And I was like, no, that, that's your t I didn't know. And he said, you sang it. It's yours. And that was my first like, oh, wait, you can make money. <laughs> and the manager at the restaurant came over and said, look, I can't pay you. But if you want to show up here and piggyback on this gig, I will always feed you a steak dinner. Mm. It was this fantastic steakhouse. And I, I mean, for a college kid, that's amazing. You know, so I said, absolutely. I'm, yes, expect me. Um, so I did. I did that. Oh gosh, I think for about a year, almost every Sunday and Monday night. Um, wow. So yeah, I mean, it, it's been a part of my life always. Um, my parents took me to see a lot of live music. They really believed in live music and live, um, it, really participating in the arts in a live way. Um, so we went to see, um, uh, actually, my mother's favorite opera is was <laughs> Madame Butterfly. So I saw that many, many times um, as a child. <laughs> and I remember getting to a certain age and really understanding what it was about and thinking, is this appropriate for a kid? You know, like, <laughs> but it was her favorite, so we saw it a bunch. Um, and we, we went to the opera. We went to theater. We went to see um, live music, the Count Basie Orchestra, every time they came through uh, Los Angeles. And we had a neighbor who was a, a former band leader, Paul Gayton. Um, he had a, a record label uh, in the 60s and 70s. His claim to fame, the, I, mean, I think the most popular act on the label was uh, Moms Mabley, the comedian. Mm -hmm. um, but he threw these fantastic parties. Uh, and he and his beautiful wife, Odile. And, and I was the only kid on the block for a while when I was really little. So, you know, they would just take me along to these parties. And then I think the adults kind of forgot I was there because <laughs> you know? they weren't thinking, oh, kids are here, you know. So I would just crawl under the piano and listen to everything and watch everything. Um, and and at, at a certain point, people would get up and start singing and playing. And it was amazing and miraculous. And I thought, oh, that I want to do that, you know. I saw Joe Williams sing and I had that reaction when I was really little. Um, he sang the verse to Something to Live For, mm. which was a song my parents loved. So I'd heard the song before, but I had never heard the verse. And the entire room was still, you know, and it was this gigantic auditorium. I think it was the Long Beach Auditorium, but I, I'm not positive. And, it, and every single person was sort of, you know, suspended. 
just waiting for the next thing he was going to say or say. And, and I grabbed my mother's skirt and I was like that, I want to do that. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before in my life. Um, so, you know, it, I, I have, there are lots of other things I enjoy doing. My degrees, uh, my undergrad degree is in psych theater and women's studies. Um, and my grad degree is in psych and theater. Um, cause I'm fascinated by lots of things, uh, but I am a singer. Like that's just kind of who I am at my heart. And an actress and a teacher as well, too. Tell us about the teaching side of what you do. Some people might not realize that. Sure. Um, I've been doing it for quite a while now. I'm the education director for the Mabel Mercer Foundation, which is um, it's thrilling. Katie Sullivan, the artistic director, who's a dear friend, tapped me to do that job a few years ago. And I just love it. Um, it started, I think it started um, back at a club I used to work at called Brought My Baby, um, a couple of people came to the club, saw my shows, and asked me if I would help them direct when they were getting ready to do a show. So I think that was the first time I ever did that sort of, you know, analyze what it is I do and, and try to figure out how someone else can do their version of, you know, they, not turn them into me because that nobody needs that. But, you know, how to help people find their own voice and their own way of telling story. Um, so I think that's what started it. And then over the years, it just came up every once in a while. I remember years and years ago, there was a program. I don't know what it was called, um, uh, but it brought kids in who were in the theater department in their various schools from all over the country. And they spent a week in New York City, going to classes and workshops with people who did this. So Broadway actors, choreographers, directors, you know, stage managers. Um, it was a great program. And a friend who was one of the tour guides asked me if I would come in with my darling Mark Hartman, who is my longtime music director and bestie, and um, if we would show the kids kind of what it is that we do when we're building a show, you know, how you choose an arrangement, how you choose the song. So we did that and it was totally fun. Um, and one of the little girls wrote me an email and to say how much she loved it. And, you know, and I said, Oh, well, I love being with you. If you ever have a question, you have my email address. Don't hesitate. Like, you know, write me. Well, she stayed in touch. And just last month, when I did the um, the CD release show for the new CD at Birdland, she brought a friend to the show. And she's a grown up lady now. I mean, I think she was thirteen when we met, and now she's thirty. You know, thirty two. <laughs> I mean, she's she's a grown up person, but she's still as lovely and as kind and as just beautiful as she always was. Um, but those kind of experiences really thrilled me. There's something about the way kids approach learning that, you know, it just gets me excited because it's almost as if they haven't learned to judge themselves harshly yet, you know, to be their worst critic. And so you can give them a note and they can make a perfect adjustment because they don't think they shouldn't. And they don't think, oh, I don't know how to do that. They just do it, you know. Um, so it started with kids, really. Um, but since then, I've done programs with adults. And now I, um, I'm one of the teachers every summer at the Eugene O'Neill um, Cabaret and Performance Conference run by our brilliant artistic director, John McDaniel. I love him so much. Oh, um, he's terrific. He was a guest. Oh, he's such a doll. And he's yeah. so good. You know, um, and you know, and director with Rosie O'Donnell for her yeah, show, her series, yeah, yeah. yeah. great guy. And great all guy. these Broadway shows, and um, recently I've seen him a couple of times with Alice Ripley doing her concert, just, who's another friend I just adore. I, she knocks me out. Um, so you know, that's usually that's adults, um, and but it's everything from people who just got out of college. I think last year, last summer, we had two twenty-one-year-olds. Um, and then a couple years ago, we had somebody who was 70, 
you know, it's, it's, people apply. In fact, today is the, the deadline. If you want to apply, go to Eugene O'Neill, the O'Neill.org and fill up that application now. <laughs> I think you have till midnight. Till midnight. Yeah. Oh, it's so On gorgeous. the Connecticut coast in Southern New it's England. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And it's basically cabaret camp. We go up there and we stay there for two weeks. Yes. And it's me and Lenny Watts and, you know, music oh, directors, great. Tracy Stark and Mark Hartman and John Weber. Um, and, and then guest instructors, you know, because that's how my first time there, I was there as a visiting artist. I came up one night, did my show, and then the next morning taught a master class. Um, and I had such a good time. Uh, in fact, I, I actually came a day early and had one session with the junior fellows who are the teens, because um, that year they were doing a tribute to Dolly Parton. And I was doing my Dolly um, show at the, around that time, 2015, when I first kind of created it. So um, Brad Simmons had me come and talk to the juniors. So I was actually there for two days. And it was it was just wonderful. And I was so thrilled and excited and honored when um, John reached out a little while after that and asked me to come on uh, regularly. It just, it's been so much fun. And so, you know, I, I feel like I get the best of both, both worlds. I get to work with adults who have some craft under their belts. You know, this is not new to them. Um, in fact, last year we had more applications than they had ever had before. So they selected eight fellows instead of, we usually have six. Um, and they were all like spectacularly experienced, you know, kids who had been on Broadway and uh, kids who were soaring in their uh, college programs and adults who had been at this for a while. And, you know, so it, everybody was at such a high level. It was really fun to get to work with people who don't need the basics at all, you know, and then sometimes they get to work with kids. Mm. Um, the Mabel Mercer Foundation and Professional Performing Arts High School did a program this year for the first time that started in October and it was 12 weeks. And I taught this elective to the juniors and seniors um, and it was the first time we talked about doing this for a long time and, and it just couldn't work it out logistically. Um, and we were finally able to do it. And Jeff Statile, who runs the theater department there, and, and KT Sullivan both said to me, now, Natalie, this is the first time. So, and it's an elective and it's, you know, extra class at the end of the day. So we made it, we'll probably get eight or nine. It's not going to be that many. And I said, that's perfect. You know, 90 minutes once a week that's the right amount of kids to have in that class. I showed up at the first class and there were 22 students. <laughs> so, and they were so gorgeous, so talented and lovely and sweet and kind. And just like, it, it was an absolute joy to be with them. Uh, and so we had 12 weeks with them. Obviously, we had some days off for, you know, Monday holidays and Christmas, Thanksgiving, etc. So um, their final show was um, on in January, the 22nd of January. And, and we did it at a club. We did it at Chelsea Table and Stage. So they could have the, the real experience after all of these weeks of doing it in the classroom you know, of, of doing it with uh, lights and sound and an audience and people, you know, and, and servers <laughs> making noise while you're singing, you know, and they were all so good. I was so proud of them. Um, it's just, it's, it's really a thrill. It is uh, exciting to me to share my love for this art form and um, my love for these artists uh, with kids, you know, I, KT first asked me to teach under the Mabel Mercer umbrella in 2013. And when I started that class, I realized that the kids who were in that class, they were mostly like 14, 15 year olds. For them, um, the producers was on Broadway when they were born, when they were babies. Like the, the golden age is hairspray. I mean, you know, like all of this, material that we think of as golden age Broadway, they don't know, you yeah. know, it's, it's way before their time, way, way. Um, so I realized from that experience very quickly that one of the things I have the, the great pleasure of doing is sharing some of this material with them, you know, so I send them to YouTube after the first class. 
um, with armed with a list of names and a list of songs. And all they have to do is give 40 seconds to each one until they find something they like. Once they find something they like, they can stop. They don't have to do, because knowing me, it's a long list. You know? <laughs> Come on. Uh, I have lots of people I love, but I want them to understand that there is a through line from, you know, showboat to um, hairspray to um, Jason Robert Brown to, you know what I mean? That there, there's, yeah. that there's this continuity Connected and they're a part yeah. of it. Right. You know, that it's, it doesn't just start with whatever their moment was, their first Broadway show or their first, you know, the first time they heard a cast album and fell in love with it. Um, and, and I also uh, find it important and, and it's one of my missions to um, make sure that kids who look like me, black and brown kids know this music belongs to them too. Because some of the images that we have seen over the last, you know, 50, 60 years might indicate that this music is only for pretty white ladies in sequin gowns. Um, and, you know, no one else is allowed to partake. Um, and that's not true at all. You know, in fact, this music doesn't exist without the contributions of black people and brown people and indigenous people and people of Asian extraction. I mean, this music has to, this music is the American melting pot. You know, it, it comes out of all of our experiences. So I want them to understand that and be proud of it. Um, so it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I just love that part of the work I do. It is sometimes a little nuts um, with, because, my concert work and my my cabaret work often means that I'm traveling. So sometimes I fly back in like that. Those twelve Mondays, I only had to miss one because um, I had a contract that was already signed and established. Um, but there were a few of them where I had to fly back in the morning of class. Mm. You know, class is at two, and I. Had to cross my fingers and hope that we landed at LaGuardia <laughs> by 10 a.m. like we were supposed to, you know, or by 11 a.m. You know, like it was it was a little scary, um, but I made it. I made it to made everyone. It. Um, so it can be a little nuts trying to make it work, but I'm really happy I get to do all these different. You do so much, and for those that are watching who are familiar, or those who are learning for the first time, you have, which are extraordinary, these acclaimed tribute shows, the series, like you were talking about at Birdland, and you have celebrated, as I mentioned, sort of in the introduction, tease a little bit, iconic artists like Nina Simone and Stevie Wonder, Stevie Nicks, Elvis Presley, you mentioned Dolly Parton, Dame Shirley Bassey, Ella Fitzgerald, Roberta Flack, Joni Mitchell, Sammy Davis Jr., Lena Horne, Cher, and many more. When did you come up with the idea to pay homage to, to celebrate these iconic artists with your very well-known and revered tribute shows? Thank you. Um, it, the first one actually was the Nina show. And that uh, happened in 2003. It's actually the year that she passed away. Um, I had done a run of shows down at the duplex cabaret room. And um, I was starting a new run, uh, like I, I think maybe two months later, um, with Jim Caruso, uh, which was at his, the first room where he did the Broadway at Birdland uh, series. It's not at Birdland, <laughs> it, was, it was somewhere else, um, a room that doesn't exist anymore. And um, he said, you know, I, I'm, I can't wait to have you, but, I think you need to do something that people will know without a doubt is not the show you just finished doing, you know, so not just a change of title, um, but something that is thematically different. Uh, and I, and up until that point, I had never done any kind of theme show at all. My shows had always been um, just the songs that spoke to me in any given moment. And um, once I put them together, I would begin to see what the arc was and I discover what the show was about. Um, but, but it was never one theme, you know, like the wor work of Cole Porter or, you know, 
the 1960s or whatever. Um, so I was trying to think of something to do. And my husband suggested, what about Nina? You know, mm. he said, because I had always had a Nina Simone song in every show I'd ever done. I have loved Nina since I was seven years old. She was one of the influences in my life. I admire everything about her. Um, and I, I, I mean, I refer to her as the soundtrack of the 20th century. You know, she was, her music was used for commercials and for films and television. And, you know, it, it's just, it's ubiquitous. And I, I have always been fascinated by her. And it had never occurred to me to do a tribute to her until Billy Joe suggested it. So, um, so we built it and it was just the most fun. And it, it really did change my career. It changed my life in many ways. Um, we've taken that show all over the world, uh, London and, and Germany and, you know, um, all over the States. It's, I love that show. It is a, a, a labor of love to sing her material and talk about her life. Um, so that was, you know, a, a long time ago. Um, and then in the years after that, I, I did some more theme shows, but not necessarily dedicated to a person. I did uh, a show celebrating Cafe Society which was the first purposefully integrated nightclub in the United States. Um, in 1938, it opened in Greenwich Village. And the headliner when they opened was Billy Holiday. Yeah. And Barney Joseph and the man who later opened the cookery and you know reintroduced the world to Alberta Hunter was the man who started that. Um, and at the time, before he opened that room, he was a, a, a shoe salesman from New Jersey. you know. Um, but he loved this music and he loved this art form. Um, and he had been to clubs in Europe and seen that they had um, not just a musical bent, but also a, a political bent and a socio-cultural um, thrust, you know, and he wondered why there wasn't more of that. So he wanted that in his club. And he, when he came home, he went to clubs in Harlem and he was shocked to see that the clubs were seating people in a segregated fashion if they allowed black customers in at all. So um, he wanted to create a room with black people and white people on stage, in the room together, sitting side by side, rubbing up against each other, you know, um, which, I mean, God bless him, you know. Um, but that was 1938, the first time that happened on purpose. Um, so I, I did a show the first time in 2008, the 70th anniversary, celebrating that. Um, so I did a bunch of different things like that, but I hadn't really hit upon the the tribute as a series until I got the chance to do uh, a residency at Birdland in 2017. And I briefly thought about bringing back some of the shows that we've done over the years, Cafe Society and Freedom Songs, which is the show about um, civil rights movements and all the music that's attached to that. Um, but I, I felt like I wanted to do something new. And my husband again said, what if you did a different artist every month? Mm. And, and it was like, oh, that sounds fabulous and gnarly at the same time. <laughs> um, but okay, let's do it. You know, um, so we started that first year, the first summer we did four shows in a row um sammy davis jr I, I created a new nina show um linda ronstadt and james shirley bassett those are the first four of the series um and then people asked me to to come back and you know do it again so we we brought a couple of them back and then i did a few new ones so the next year it was six shows and then in 2019 we did 11 you know and in 2020, we had booked 11 too, but we never got beyond the, the January show, which uh, was my birthday show. It was a reprise of the Ella show. But um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. Yeah. And there were times it was really daunting because again, I was traveling a lot. And at that point, uh, sometimes I was gone two weeks out of the month and then I'd come back just in time for the show. Um, and I wasn't always with Mark Hartman. Um, he's very busy and um, music directs a lot of theater and for other artists. So um, sometimes we wouldn't get to actually be in the same room until the day of the show. 
<laughs> Although one time I flew to Minneapolis because he was conducting at the Guthrie. And um, I we had a rehearsal in the rehearsal space. <laughs> Because that was the only time we were going to get to be together before. That was the Sammy Davis Jr. show, the first one. Um, so, yeah, it was a, a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And I loved it. And a lot of the songs that wound up on this album grew out of those shows. Because I would do those shows and then sometimes travel with those shows, take them other places. And after the show, people were so kind to come up to me and say, oh, my God, I, did you record that song? Is that song on it? You know, um, do you have a recording of this entire show? And I, and I would say, no, no, I don't have, you know, no. Oh, we haven't done that yet. You know, so when I was lucky enough to get signed with Club 44 Records and started talking with the guys, it was just so exciting to be able to have this list mm. that was really ready to go, you know. Uh, I mean, my initial list was 63 songs, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> too much. Well, the narrowing down process yeah. is so different. You become an yeah. editor, right? But yeah, <laughs> totally. But um, but it was fun, and I, I, they were excited by some of the same ideas I was. So you know, we and there was a total collaboration in creating the album. Um, I was really lucky working with Wayne Hahn as my producer and. Joel Lindsay as executive producer and he's um, A&R at the label. And they're both also brilliant songwriters. Um, and I was a fan of their work because I knew um, Billy Stretch who's on the label, Linda Lavin, J uh, Jane Monheit, Jim Caruso, the, um, Jim, Billy, and Cleo Blackhurst, Birdland Swing and Christmas album is on that label. Um, I had a lot of label mates I just love um, on on. Club 44 Records, uh, Julie Banco um, from uh, Funny Girl and um, Harmony, and soon to be Cafe Carlisle. She's going to do um, a cabaret show. I think she's doing three nights at the Carlisle in May. They just announced today, which is fantastic. I hope I'm in town. For, I'm gone for part of May, so I hope it's when I'm here. Um, um, and Brian Ng, I don't know if you know Brian, fantastic jazz player and singer. Just, he's great. I found Brian by way of Katie Sullivan and Jim Caruso uh, when I was um, curating and, and hosting the Nat King Cole night two years ago for uh, Mabel Mercer Foundation Cabaret Convention at Jazz at Lincoln Center. KT brought him to my attention and, oh, uh, he's just amazing. Um, so he's on the label now. So, you know, I, I love their taste. Um, and they wrote a song for Billy on his Billy's Place album, which is the album he put out sort of toward the end of lockdown with the same name as his virtual show. You know, just like you and, and so many of us, he, he created a thing, a weekly. Um, I didn't do a weekly thing, but I did a bunch of these, you know, guesting for people. And, and he had a weekly show, Billy's Place playing and singing in his home and he put out an album and um joel and wayne wrote a song um blue again i think is the title i think mm. that's right oh my god it's so good mm. i love it so much so I, I i was a fan of the work that they had done i heard on other people's albums like 11 has one of their songs um but i had no idea they were going to write something for me i was completely stunned and it was completed when they played it for me. I mean, it was, and it was amazing because it was so me, you know, it, it sounded like things I say, things I think. Um, so I, I, I had to assume that, you know, the conversations we had, the dinners that we had and the, the times we talked about everything under the sun, including the record, but, you know, we were friends. We talk about all kinds of things um, that they, they really heard me and they wrote something that summed me up, which was kind of amazing. So yeah, that was really fun. And then, you know, um, I hadn't thought of putting a, a Disney song on the album, mm -hmm. but Wayne had an idea. Um, he liked, there was a Disney song that he really liked. And I agreed. I liked that one too. Um, but it, I, 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 I knew when he said it, I was like, wait, wait, there's something there's something that I've always wanted to, you know, and I couldn't, like, it wasn't in the front of my brain. Um, so I, I left the studio and I thought about it for a minute. And then I remembered 
again, little kid, obsessed with the Jungle Book album. Completely obsessed with it. I think I wore it out, like literally. Um, mostly singing The Bare Necessities over and over again. But I loved every song, every single song from that score. And I thought, oh, trust in me. I remembered that I had toyed with putting it in the show, like, maybe 15 years ago, maybe longer ago than that. Mark and I had sort of like just kind of fooled around with it at rehearsal and it never really gelled. We didn't know what it was. Um, so I mentioned it to Wayne and he loved the idea. And we started talking about that arrangement and we came up with something that was just for this album. You know, I'd never sung it before. I never sung it in front of anybody until the CD release. Um, but it turned out to be this really like, kind of spooky, kind of sexy, like thing that's very different from the children's song. <laughs> and it it was first meant to be. Um, and that's something I love doing. I love taking material and kind of finding a new story that fits. You know, it doesn't change it too much. Because um, at a certain point, I think if, if you're changing the intention of the author completely, right. um, you know, it, it, there's probably a better song if, right. if it if it doesn't sound like that song anymore you know melodically and and emotionally and it's just a completely different thing but i think you know giving something a twist that's fun um so it was this this has just been a truly delightful process and i'm so happy yes i love out. the cover and tell us about the meaning of the the title batch sure. to the garden well, um, Woodstock is on this album. It's one of my very favorite songs. Um, I love Joni, like everyone else who breathes. Um, Joni Mitchell is a genius. We all acknowledge that. And I have always loved the song. Uh, and I actually put it in the Freedom Song Show, the first time I ever sang it. Um, so that was 2012. And um, for me... I had never been able to choose between Joni's version of it and the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young version of it. I love them both. I love them both for different reasons. They both do different things. So uh, working with Mark Hartman again, Mark and I talked about putting them together, finding some way of, of capturing what we loved about both of them. And in doing that show um, the first time, which was April of, 2012 and it was an election year and uh it was also shortly after um i mean not shortly after it was i guess a couple months after but trayvon martin had been murdered and so there were a lot of songs in that show that spoke to turmoil and and um crisis and uh conflict and i wanted to make sure that the show wasn't all that because that's not the only thing that is, you know, um, it's real. And I, I firmly believe that we have a responsibility as artists to talk about what's real and not just to give a pretty pink version of the world, you know. But um, I also think that hope is important and um, believing that things can get better is important. And that song has always inspired me and always made me feel hopeful because Joni wrote this thing that is actually scientifically true. We are a carbon-based life form and we are billion year old stardust. That's the lyric of the song. And we are the carbon from which we are made is, is from old dead stars. Like, so I, I often introduce this song by saying, no matter how bad it gets, when I think about this song, it reminds me that eventually we have to shine. It's who we are. It's in the very atoms of our being. So that song gives me hope and life and joy. So I sing it a lot. And when we were talking about this album, I had just done a version of my 60s show that we called Back to the Garden. And so I was talking about that song and that title and Joel really liked the title and and said there's something I'm hearing in that 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 could apply to music beyond the 60s and I said well 
for since so much of this music is music that I found when I was young, it, it's this music represents a lot of my influences, um, a lot of the things that go up to making me who I am. Um, the first song I ever learned, for example. Um, I think there's something in Back to the Garden that's like bringing it all home, bringing it all back to the place from whence it all springs, you know, the, the garden, creatively speaking, um, the garden as a source of inspiration, um, the garden sort of allegorically, you know, Eden. Um, so I, it just, it, it seemed right. And the more we selected songs, the more we decided what was in and what was out, the more clear it was, oh, this fits, this is, this is the perfect title, you know. Um, the, there was another song that Wayne suggested that I hadn't thought of, um, Who, which is the oldest song in the album, the Jerome mm -hmm. Kern tune. Oscar which Hammerstein, is, right, yeah. Yes, 1925. Right. And um, he, he, in a rehearsal studio, Wayne just said, you know what I, I love, you might not, this might not be your thing, but I love Pearl Bailey. And I was like, oh my God, me too. I love Pearl Bailey. Ah. And she actually was very good friend of one of my friend's grandmothers growing up. Oh. Um, I didn't know her, but, you know, I saw her on occasion. She was friends with, with Lynn. And um, so I, I have always loved her. And he played this arrangement, Pearl did, with the, a group called the Charioteers. I think it was the uh, early 40s. And I just loved it. I was like, oh, oh, yes, we have to figure out our version of that we have to because that's that's great and weird and fun and pearl you know um so it's this album sort of speaks to all these things that i have loved always you know uh, when i was doing the linda ron set show i read her autobiography which i highly recommend it is yeah. so dreamy if you have not read it um she writes so beautifully about herself and her life and her career and her craft um, and she talks about uh, how people were surprised every time she changed genres, you know, um, when she was suddenly singing Gilbert and Sullivan on Broadway. Um, she was singing standards. She was singing uh, Spanish language songs, you know, that, that a lot of people, people kept being surprised by her. But she said, you know, she didn't understand what was surprising about it because all of this music was the music that was around her when she was a child. So she never attempted anything that wasn't a part of her formative years, that wasn't in her DNA, basically, you know? And when I read that, that really resonated. Um, Cause I, I thought, yeah, that's, that's what my life is too. I mean, I sing all kinds of things. I sing show tunes, I sing country music. My parents were from Texas. Um, and my dad introduced me to Patsy Cline and Dolly Parton very early, you know, <laughs> so I didn't stand a chance, um, you know, and, and I grew up with the Ray Charles country album, you know, and I have always known that, um, country music is as much a black artist form as it is a white artist form. Um, and I love standards which I, I, as i've said you know my parents were uh, much older when they adopted me so they love the the music of world war ii and the, you know that was the, their music um so, and that's why my mother ended up teaching me you'll never know um I, I sometimes tell this joke that you know when i when i learned this music and it opened a door to me i was obsessed with it and i became voracious about finding more of it um so that you know, when other little girls wanted to play Charlie's Angels on the playground, I wanted to play Alice Faye. You know? right. <laughs> Nobody knew who that was. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> Alice Blue Gown, it's a, there's a movie. And, you know, anyway. Um, so, right. um, yeah, so I, you know, so I had that as an influence, but I was also growing up in L.A. in the 70s. So that Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles, J.D. Souther, Carla Bonoff, Andrew Gold. The whole L.A. Vibe, that, yeah. Yeah, that Jackson Brown, that sound of the canyons, 
you know, of Laurel Canyon. I loved that. And I went to a, a girl's school, private girl's school that when I started there was K through 12. So uh, I followed around a lot of the seniors like a baby duck. I just kind of latched onto them and think, you're cool. Show me things, you know. Um, and I, I listened to their music. I mean, I think that might have been the first time I heard Joni, you know. Um, the stuff that they liked, the stuff that these teenagers were into. I was this little six-year-old going, what, what, play it again, you know? Um, and I will say at the girls' school, there, if you weren't sporty and I was only good at basketball, I wasn't good at anything else. And that was only because I was this tall when I was 10. I got to be five, six at 10 years old and then I didn't grow anymore. Um, so, so I wasn't good at any of the other sporty things. Um, so those of us who are not sporty had to entertain ourselves in other ways. And one of them was that we would get out the guitars and we would sit around, you know, a whole bunch of girls and sing harmony and, and sing scores of, you know, Godspell from beginning to end. It just, you know, that's how we entertained ourselves. So it was it, music and all of these different kinds of music were a part of my daily existence. Um, and and still are, you know. It, that's really never changed. That album is filled with so many incredible songs. Begin the Begin, of course, Cole Porter's classic. The first time ever I saw your face, spectacular version of that, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. That's probably the one that we've been waiting to put on an album the longest, because I first started singing that in two thousand one, maybe. 2000 something like that um <clears throat> mark hartman and i built a show uh down at the duplex um oh actually maybe it was 2002 uh, who cares uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> sometimes i get i get like oh but the date i can and then i realize no one cares natalie stop uh, <laughs> <It was before laughs> <COVID>. <laughs> a long time ago long time ago um we i i booked a show um called the first time and um because i knew that song was going to be in it but for some reason mark and i never rehearsed that one song there were a lot of other pieces in the show that were brand new and things we were do trying that were you know like on the edge oh i don't know if i can get that so we rehearsed everything else um and i think he was out of town in and out of town i think he might have been doing some theater project at that time too so we didn't have a lot of time and it wound up like not getting done until the day of the show is <laughs> sound check <laughs> where we both sort of laughingly said, we should probably sing through this morning. <laughs> you know? um, and, and oddly it, it just sprang forth kind of the way you hear it on the album. Um, his ideas, my ideas, working together, getting inspiration from each other. Um, and creating this version of it that made perfect sense to both of us. And um, it's pretty much been that since the first time we did it. I mean, there've been a, a couple things that we've changed here and there, but, um, and there are moments in, in the performing of it that we make changes, you know, but, but the, the shape of it and, and that gorgeous sort of waterfall pattern that Mark does through it, the, his, a stupendous playing through that um, is just how that has always been. And um, a, this past summer, we did it up at the O'Neill. Um, when when I did my sort of faculty show, um, I did it with Lenny Watts. He did half the show and I did half the show. And um, in my half, I put first time in just because it's one of my favorite things to sing. Um, and Mark is up there as one of the music directors, but because we had so many students and it was, you know, there was so much going on, um, John McDaniel had tapped one of my other best friends um, to be music director for the show Lenny and I did so that we didn't have to take Mark away from his fellows to work our stuff. Um, so Brian Nash was they're playing the show for us. And and Brian said to me the day of the show, it's like, you know, it's weird to play Mark's arrangement of Mark's song when Mark's sitting in the room. And I said, oh, wow, I hadn't even thought of that. Um, oh, what, 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 uh, 
well, what can we do? And he said, <laughs> what if we forehanded it? And I was like, oh, oh, that's a good idea. Yes, let, yes, I say yes. So, you know, he asked Mark and Mark was like, yes. And they did that for the first time. And I wept through the entire thing. It was so spectacular. So um, they did it again at my New Year's Eve bash. Uh, and then they, they did it when we just did the um, CD release. They did that version of it. Because as, as gorgeous and full um, and beautifully orchestrated as this album is, you know, when we did the CD release, I knew I wasn't going to have a symphony there. Um, you can do a lot at Birdland, <laughs> but right. I wasn't sure that we had room for all that, you know. Um, so, it, so it was really fun working with Mark to figure out how we were going to create some of these sounds and and make these songs live in a way that felt like it honored the album, mm -hmm. but also was not trying to copy this thing, you know, you can't make seven pieces sound like 40 pieces like that, you know. So, um, so it was really, really fun. And that was one of the, the ideas that they both suggested and I loved it. And it was, it was just like nothing. I mean, they, you know, I, I think there was a mid show standing ovation for that. You know, it just, it was so gorgeous. So many amazing songs on the album, Trust in Me, the work song, you'll never know. He lives in a world of his own. And uh, love is the power that heals me. Another incredible, I mean, that every single one is unique. There's there's a connection to all of these songs. I know hard to start with 66 and then concisely <laughs> pick it and bring it down to the 11. Yeah. And you even do a version of Cindy Lauper's True Colors, which was a really beautiful interpretation. Thank you. Yeah, I have always loved that song. Um, it has been, you know, an anthem, I think, for a whole lot of us who didn't feel mainstream um, for 30 something years, 40 years? Is it 40 years now? Um, but. I never thought of singing it. Uh, I have friends who sing it beautifully. And I have sung other things that Cindy made famous, but um, not that. And Wayne suggested it, actually. Um, and, I, and I said, okay, I'll try it. Sure, why not? Um, and in that rehearsal studio, the first time, as I was singing it, I burst into tears. And I realized that we could have our own thing to say with it, you know. and that we still need to hear it. We all still do, you know. Um, there are far too many people who, whose message seems to be, don't be who you are. <laughs> like, yeah. Hide everything about you that I find that makes me uncomfortable, you know. Um, even though what someone else, who someone else is, doesn't have anything to do with you, you know. But, um, and so while we're in this place of people, you know, banning drag queens um, and attacking trans kids, you know, and telling black kids they can't wear their hair, they can't wear their locks, it, you know, at school, I feel like there's something in True Colors that we all need to hear again about, you know, the way you are is beautiful. The way you are she doesn't need to be changed. And I feel like if the people who are trying to make other people conform really believe that about themselves, then they wouldn't try and make other people conform. You know? Like if, if you didn't feel like your identity was threatened by someone who exists on the planet who was assigned female at birth, you know, and and isn't, then you wouldn't try to control what that person does because it has nothing to do with you. But something in you is saying, I'm not okay. Some voice you hear. And rather than dealing with that, you know, um, I love James Baldwin, one of my favorite writers of all time, um, said that he he believed people cling so tightly to their hate hatreds because they know if they give it up they would have to deal with pain mm -hmm. 
And I. They'd have to look in the mirror. Yeah. 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 And I really think that that we're in this moment, you know, societally, culturally, politically, where that's what's going on. You know, a lot of people are dancing very fast to control other people and and eradicate other people so they don't have to look at themselves. You know, and I think True Colors is this great moment of looking at yourself or, or, and, and hearing someone look at you and say, you're fine. You're good. You know, you're good the way you are. So um, I, I, it just, it resonates. And that's how I choose a song always, whether it's for a show or an album or, you know, I can't sing something that I don't believe. It's an incredible collection of songs. Uh, what was it like when it was finally completed? What was that feeling like for you? It had to be extraordinary. <sighs> yeah. Well, every step has really been great. I mean, um, we I, I tracked it last February in um, Nashville, which is where the label is based. Um, and we actually did the photos the next day. So it was interesting because we tracked, uh, I think, in nine of the songs, eight, eight of the songs. We didn't do them all that day in the studio. Um, so we knew a lot of what was on it, but we I don't know that we had made the final, like, two or three decisions. And um, we ha were still, like, loving that title and sticking with that title. But we certainly didn't have an order or anything like that. Um, but this fantastic Nashville photographer, Jeremy Ryan, who also is a singer and performer, um, I met him the day of the shoot, and we had such a good time. He's so good. Um, and he just, I, I brought a bunch of different looks, and we did, I think, five different looks. And, and he ended up taking something like 900 pictures. I mean, he is just fantastic. and. Um, so I, I, I knew that I loved working with him and that we were going to get something that I would enjoy. You know, there was no way that we weren't going to get something that would make perfect sense to me as the album cover. Um, and I had such a great time in the studio the day before with uh, Jason Webb, who's the piano player. These were all people, the, the guys who tracked um, a lot of the songs, not, not on everything, but they were people that Wayne had worked with before, Wayne and, and Joel and other people to label, but I didn't meet them until the day of the recording. And they were wonderful. They were fantastic. And we had this great rapport and we had a great time and we got a lot done, you know. Um, so every step has been really lovely and has been completely collaborative. I mean, I didn't know because, the, as you know, I, my first three albums were um, it, not on a label. You know, we independently produced. So I didn't know exactly what that experience was going to be like, you know. Um, but I, I saw Linda Levin um, in a place she was doing December of 2022 here in New York City um, called you, you, will, you Will Get Sick, You Will Be Sick. It was so good. Um, and I and I waited after to say hi and tell her I love her, which you know I'm sure she's sick of hearing me say because I've been saying that to her for decades. Um, but um, I do, I love you. You're awesome. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> she did you um, watch Mel's Diner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course I did. Of course, I watched Alice when I was a kid. I was like she's hot. Um, she's brilliant, and so um, she. She said, oh, um, I just had dinner with Wayne and we, we were talking, you're, you're on the label, congratulations. And she said, look, you're gonna keep waiting for the other shoe to drop because <laughs> they're so nice and good at what they do. It's gonna feel too good to be true and you're gonna keep waiting. And she's like, there's no shoe. They are that nice. They are that good at what they do. They are that tight. You know, and she's absolutely right. They are a fantastic team. They really have been so easy to work with. And, very supportive um, too, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and it's great. I mean, it, rather than, you know, I, I mean, I've heard people have experiences where they felt stifled by, you know, someone, a label saying, no, you can't do that. Or, you know, um, I have felt utterly supported and also encouraged, you know, um, can we try this? Yeah, let's try it. You know, and, and that's amazing. You know, that's a fantastic experience. And um, I mean, I brought them the um, song that was written for Shirley Bassey. He lives in a world of his own because I had found that when I was doing my Shirley Bassey research. Um, Lionel Bart wrote it when Shirley was auditioning for the film of Oliver. Uh, he kept writing new material. Uh, you know, when, when they do a film of a movie music, of a mu musical that has been on Broadway or West End, they have to write something new if they want to get a nomination for an Academy Award. So they always write new songs when they go from stage to film. But he was writing specifically for Shirley because he wanted her to play Nancy and she really wanted it. Um, and, and I think one of the husbands, I don't know which one, I can't remember, uh, had promised her that he was going to get this, you know. Um, so, but the powers that be did not love the idea. It did not happen. Uh, so none of those songs went into the show. He wrote several. Um, she recorded this one, He Lives in a World of His Own, and one other um, on a, what was going to be a single. Um, she was going to put both of them on the next album she was, studio album she was recording, and then they would be released as a single. So they made this demo, this acetate demo of one song on one song and one on the other, but then they never went on the album. So they never released it. And this song doesn't exist anywhere, really. Um, so when I was doing the Shirley research, I read about it and I thought, what? I have to find this. <laughs> um, and God bless some fan on YouTube who had uploaded it because she used it in a TV special she did in the 70s. Um, it's actually kind of amazing because she's walking on the beach in like a headscarf and a housecoat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the opposite of Shirley Bassey, like, yeah. like not the glamorous right. Shirley Bassey. Right. Um, and there's footage of her, her then husband, I think at that point it was the Italian husband, and like her kids playing on the beach and she's not actually singing it. She's just, it's like playing over the scene of her walking, you know? Um, and that's the only way I could hear it because it didn't exist anywhere else. But somebody uploaded that and I played it for Brian Nash, who was the MD for the Shirley Bassey show. And Brian was like, oh yes, we have to put this in. Um, so we did it the first time with As Long As He Needs Me because they're kind of the same song. You know, they, there's something in them that speaks to each other. But um, when I, I played it for Wayne and Joel, they heard it and went, oh yeah, this." This standing alone, you know, has to be recorded. It has to be out in the world. And I agree. Um, I love and have always loved a big, like, full out singing, you know, um, emotional, some might call it melodramatic. I am not those people. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love that. Because, um, I, I, I mean, I always say, you know, people have big feelings. So why shouldn't we sing about them? Everything isn't ironic or cool yeah. or, right. you know, like, just kidding. Some things are real Some and, and are we, real. we feel them in a big way. And I love that song. So then Wayne came up with that arrangement, which is so Bondian, you know, which is perfect for a Shirley Bassey song because she's still the only person to have recorded three Bond themes. Um, so yeah, I I just love it. I love everything about it, and I was so excited that they got excited at the same thing that you know I did. It, it's just it's been a dream, and I'm thrilled. I'm getting to take you know go to London and and mm -hmm. um, sing some of this material over there, and and take the album over there, and, and we're in outside San Francisco in Orinda next month, um, and Florida. You know, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's just. Did you fun. ring up uh, Dame Shirley and let her know that you're on your way? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, she's in Monte Carlo now. 
That's right. She's, she, yeah, she's not in, in she's London in a sweet anymore. spot there, yes. Yes, I, I, I know someone who, who is really good friends with her, which was hysterical because I did not know that. I mean, I've known him for years. He's a fantastic friend. Um, and when I was doing the Shirley Bassey show that first time, I ran into him and he said, oh, what are you working on? He's actually a lovely Frenchman, so I believe. What are you working on? You know, and um, and I said, "Oh, Shirley Bassey, um, I'm doing a Shirley, you know, show." And he, <laughs> Shirley, Shirley Bassey, <laughs> I'm like, yes, Shirley. No, your mom, Shirley, no, Dame Shirley Bassey. Yeah. And he said, "Oh, she's my best friend." I said, like, "Stop it, she's not." And he shows me texts from Shirley, <laughs> and she. she so uh, we actually took the Shirley Bassett show to London in 2018. And he said to me that she, he wrote her and she said she might try to come and, you know, but I, oh, I, I would have been too, that would make me crazy. I, you know, <laughs> I, I love her dearly. I, I would fall apart. <laughs> it would be the clamped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So totally the clamped. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you love this so much? You've been doing this for a long time and it, it's in your heart and soul and you give so much of yourself in the process of doing it, whether it's on stage, whether it's in the studio, whether it's meeting and greeting people or just celebrating it all. The inspiration, the joy and the blessings that you have in your life that sort of allow you to be the conduit, the facilitator of this energy larger than yourself that flows through and out of you. Tell us about some of those continued blessings and joys in your life that keep you creating and sharing and celebrating for the good of all of us now. Thank you. Um, I think it's, well, I mean, I, I really do love stories. I really do love real human emotion. And I feel like part of the job we do is to experience real human feelings in front of people. That's certainly what I go to see when I go see someone work. Um, and I have been very blessed. I mean, um, my I, I met my biological dad uh, several years ago now. I think it was five, six years. Um, I, I grew up not knowing I was adopted, which is a whole other show. Um, and um, once I found out, I, for a long time, I couldn't find any information about um, my biological parents. But my um, adopted parents were fantastic people. And uh, they were perfect people. But they were great. And uh, they gave me a fantastic childhood. Um, so I didn't feel deprived. Um, I, I, there was just this new piece of information. And I, and I wanted to know more about you know, from whence I come. Um, and finding my dad was amazing. I mean, he's, he, it is amazing. He's a, a fantastic man. We get along great. I am so his kid. Uh, like, wow. Um, we have so many things in common. And, and I did not know him. But like, even to the point, my husband has said many times that we, um, we, we deliver a line in the same way. Our timing is the same. Uh, he is a, a minister and a community activist. Um, he is one of the founding student members of the, uh, the Black Student Union at San Francisco State back in the day. Um, so, you know, he's an OG hippie, which makes me so happy. Um, I really love everything about that counterculture. All those kids. I wanted to grow up and be that, but by the time I grew up, they were yuppies and that was terrible. Uh, so like, uh, he's, he's a fantastic human being and, um, I have met all of this extra family, you know? Um, so now I've met a lot of biological cousins, and, um, they're wonderful people and they're a lot of singers and, um, it, it just, and, and there's people who look like me, which is really fun and fabulous to, um, because growing up, I, I didn't know I was adopted. Um, and I look a little like some of my cousins, um, but not a lot, you know. Um, so I was always sort of trying to find my face in other people's faces. Um, and it wasn't until I, I met 
Arnold that I got the chance to really see that. He sent me a picture of his mother mm. uh, when we first connected. We connected over the internet. I Ancestry.com. Okay. Um, so um, he sent me a picture of his mother, Thelma, and, and I was looking at a picture of me. You know, that was just like, oh, my God, wow. Um, so I, I feel exceedingly fortunate. Um, I am blessed in my choice of husband. <laughs> he is, um, you know, the best man I know, and he is. Uh, we've been together thirty-one years, and um, he, we still make each other laugh. We still have a good time together, and I am blessed with many wonderful friends. I mean, I, even you know, I have I have a few super close friends, but even some of the people that are not extremely close with I have a lot of friends and I think this does happen to actors a lot you know when we work together when we're on the same show or we're on the same you know gig the same review or something or symphony gig we get really really close and that's real um and then you maybe don't see those people for five years you know? right. um but but the, it still feels real you know it still feels like these people know who I really am and I know who they really are and we're really connected to one another um so I, I think I've had a lot of blessings and a lot of um, good fortune. And um, I, and I, I think I share it. I try to, you know, um, I've always believed that kindness was more important than nicety. Um, so, you know, I'm not always nice, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I try to always be kind. Right. Um, and I, and I try to be truthful, you know, um, it's, it's, it's funny. I didn't know growing up that there was this big secret about me in my family, but I knew that there were secrets. I knew there were things that like my parents didn't, you know, fully tell me Express, about. Yeah. yeah. That there was something, you know, and it drove me nuts. <laughs> it drove me insane. Um, and and my my entire family, the family I grew up with, you know, they used to joke that like you couldn't tell me anything because I would just tell everyone <laughs> as a child. Um, uh, my my cousin Norman Jean used to say, "Natalie is a frank child." You know, <laughs> I would just I would just tell the truth. Um, I found it easier than telling lies. Um, so you know, I I, I am. You should be in Washington. <laughs> Well, as I said, politics is sort of the family business, but but I, I tell the truth. <laughs> so <laughs> that might be problematic. That um, would be, right? That'd go against yeah, the grain. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember I asked my godfather, my uh, who's my cousin technically, but um, when he was mayor of Los Angeles, I asked him once, I said, why don't you ever, why aren't you allowed to say that someone is lying? You know, if, if you, if someone creates an, an ad, an oppo ad against you. You know, why can't you say the word lie? Because um, uh, for a long time, that was sort of the conventional wisdom in politics. No one ever called anyone else a liar um, until we had a black president. And then suddenly, hmm, interesting. Uh, but <laughs> now they scream but, it at uh, state I know. union addresses. I know, exactly. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, he said it, that it was, that it was just this, this um, a gentleman's agreement kind of thing, you know, that, that, that they, they didn't call each other out in that way. And I remember thinking, but that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know? I mean, you want people to know what you actually believe, what you, what actual policies you wouldn't stay, you know, that you would, you would uh, introduce to the, the, the political arena you want people to know what you believe in what your values are and if someone is telling lies about you why couldn't you say no those are lies i don't believe that no. um it didn't really register so you know I, I i decided a long time ago that politics is not as much as i love it and i'm fascinated by it and i am certainly a political preacher um i uh I do not, I don't think I would be a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me 
me lies. Tell me sweet little <laughs> lies. Right <laughs> on her really. next album. <laughs> 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 Wait, I'm writing this down. <laughs> yeah, writing it down. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I always say, I, I some people, you know, um, debate whether or not artists should be political, uh, uh, you know, um, outside of the, we have a platform, but some people believe that we should not use that platform uh, to promote any particular point of view or cause or whatever. Um, and I understand that. Um, but I, I kind of don't, I don't, it just, it, it's not who I am. It wouldn't fit me. It wouldn't suit me. Um, I think, you know, politics is just how we get along. If, if we still lived in a village and there were only 40 of us, you know, we could gather together and fight it out, you know, deciding what, whether we want to plant wheat or corn or whatever. We, we would just decide, you know, in, in these big meetings or but we, there are too many of us for that. And so politics is how we decide what we're going to do as a society. That's what it is. It's not, it doesn't have any other meaning than that. So I, I, I don't fully understand people who wash their hands a bit because you really don't care what we do as a society? Really? You know, I mean, I do understand some people feel like they care, but their voice doesn't matter, you know? Um, and so it's not so much that they wash their hands of it as they feel powerless. Um, but, you know, I, I think the more of us that care and the more of us that make choices, the better it can be. So, you know, dive on in. <laughs> um, is there a memoir in the offing at all for you well my husband has suggested it on, huh? on many yeah there are so many stories like just the adoption story and finding out about it and all of the coincidences and all of the i mean it is it's it's very dramatic and and theatrical and should probably be a movie um i i thought about it a lot um so i don't know Maybe we'll see. I mean, I do. I love, I love to write, in the sense that I love to tell the story. I hate to do the actual physical writing. <laughs> <laughs> so Which maybe is, a ghost writer? <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's like I I know how to shape the story. Right. I know how to tell the story. I just hate like sitting in a chair like being, being stuck yeah. there, chained to that desk. Yeah, for hours. yeah. I do, oh, I don't oh, like that. Please. Part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that part, which is so funny. I mean, it's just it's weird. Yeah. Um, I was you know for all of my like skipping grades and and graduating early and and you know graduating, like getting straight A's and everything. I I never did a paper until the last minute <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I just. I would, I would know what I was going to say. I would right. have an outline. I would do all the research. Yeah. But the actual sitting down and, and typing, and doing that, you know, yeah. either at the typewriter or at the computer, I, I, oh, I dreaded it, and I would put it off and put it off and put it off. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. <laughs> So the answer is stay tuned, folks. There might be one down the line. <laughs> there might be. And, well, I'm I'm trying to learn how to use my my like dictation yeah. app. You know, Audio I'm trying book. to learn yeah, yeah how to yeah. use that properly so that so I you might can sort of write, record yeah. the memory. And then yeah, and then I think I find it easier to um to edit because I like editing. I really like editing. Once I've written it, I really love that. You yeah. Know? But um, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, we'll stay tuned for that and everything else you've got going on. Lots of travel. There's the uh, album, folks. It's back to the garden. Now you know a little bit more about it. And you also know a little bit more with her return visit about the extraordinary, gifted, talented Natalie Douglas joining us here on the show. Uh, Natalie, this really was a true blessing to have you here as it always is your array of sunshine and positivity and humor and uh we're gonna as we always do keep the porch light on for you as we do for all the guests there's we've been showing the website throughout the broadcast nataliedouglas.com go to all of the uh streaming services and download 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 and share it and celebrate folks because she worked so hard 
on this as, album. Um, as uh, Wayne Hahn, producer, <laughs> always says, um, when you get tired of listening to it, uh, streaming it on Spotify, just turn it down, but leave it on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just let it stream. <laughs> the soundtrack of your life. Exactly. <laughs> Which does help. <laughs> it does. It really does. You are a gem and uh, continue to spread the word about our show. You're always a welcome friend here, Natalie. Congratulations on everything. And hopefully we'll see you in the flesh real soon as well. It's nice virtually, but uh, in person is even better. And uh I look really forward to blessed, it. Blessing to have you here. And I hope you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely, absolutely have with you, my friend. Always a treat to chat with you. You're you're just a delight. It's so much fun. I appreciate that. And as my father has always said, sage advice he told me when I was seven years old, he said, Jim, always remember, whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, be sure and always thank them. And then ask them to please put those words in writing and address it management. <laughs> right. So true, right? Don't let it go to waste. Don't let it go. Send it up to whoever management is. Make sure they see those kind words. Right. <laughs> Sage what advice from dad. <laughs> a wise man, clearly. That's it, I tell you. You're the best. Uh, thanks for all of the time. A wonderful conversation. And uh, you really are a blessing. Congratulations and everything. And we'll see you again real soon, my friend. Okay? I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Bye, everybody. Cheers. Take care. The incomparable Natalie Douglas joining us here on the Jim Masters Show Entertainment Lifestyle Celebrity Talk Show Series. Was she not a hoot, a delight, and a very positive individual. She sure is. We really love having her here. And we thank you for watching this episode as well, folks. A great conversation. She's a great conversationalist. We took it in so many different directions. And of course, celebrating the breaking news of the incomparable, the spectacular, beautiful album, Back to the Garden, with all of those great songs. What was really beautiful was she was sharing some of the meaning of those songs to her and why they were selected. Originally, 66 narrowed down to the 11, and what the process was like putting the album together, working with that incredible team of extraordinary, talented arrangers, producers, musicians, studio folk, and really just incredible. And of course, her tribute shows that she's done to some of the most iconic artists of our time. She really is a, an American treasure, and she's off to Florida and London and everywhere else celebrating and sharing her talent with the world. NatalieDouglas.com is the website as well. And if you enjoyed this episode and all the episodes you enjoy, do something special. Give this episode a like on our YouTube channel, which is Jim Masters TV, where there's over 1,100 episodes. I can't believe that. And counting that we've done so far in the four years. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Jim Masters TV. Give it a like. And leave a comment for us. Interact with us. What did you enjoy about our conversation about Natalie Douglas and some of her incredible commentary on this show and her incredible music? And if you're a super fan of Natalie's as well, like we are, share that comment on our YouTube channel. Let us know. We're very interactive. And um, if you do subscribe to the YouTube channel, click the notification bell so you never miss any of the episodes. You will get an alert from us when we have all these great shows so that was a terrific conversation. My cup was filled. I'm sure yours is as well. Come by and see us again. We'll keep the porch light on for you as well right here at Lovety Hall and the Gym Masters Show Live Series. Appreciate you being here. I thank you for your time this time till next time. And don't forget, as we always say, to love one another, take care of one another, and don't forget to love and take care of yourself. Very important. Come join us on the next one right here on the Gym Masters Show. We'll see you again soon. We love you all and cheers.